sort of the same as helps others, but he'll come in when someone is in trouble. I mean, he's not afraid for himself. Somebody who shows up, one of the people who's <coughs> right? Yeah, and even if they're uh, like being beaten on, he might intercede. Yeah, intercede, nice. Now, when you think of, of you know, what a Talmud Hacham, a Torah scholar, how a Torah scholar would behave, is it all of these things? Do other things come to mind? Different ideas? You, you could be a Torah scholar, but you could be so devoted and studied that you don't go out real life. Okay. So, so practice it. So, that's sort of so a Torah scholar can get a little insular. Okay, what else? Devoted. Devoted. What else? Educated. Educated. Yes? Argument 
one, basically. Um, in the Talmud, right? We have this, is it kosher or not? Well, I'm, I'm sitting here in my living room. I need to know if it's kosher or not, right? Because I, I have something to do. Um, so that was, was the one very early law code, but then my Maimonides went through, and he basically went through and picked the, the uh, there was, there was a lot of logic to why he picked the, the, the answers that he picked, but he basically went through, and of these unresolved arguments, was like, this one is correct, this one is correct, this one is correct, and codified that into a very, very clear, well-organized law code called the Mishnah Torah, which means second Torah, basically. Um, he was many, many things. Humble was not one of them. I'm going to call my book the second Torah. No big deal. Um, he was a great, 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 great legal thinker. His Hebrew was so clear and beautiful. It's great for, you know, early, you know, early their studies for medical students who are trying to struggle through all this language. It's just clear and easy to access and accessible. And when you open up, if you open up a lot of different law codes and you're just trying to figure out the answer to a particular question, it's like, I don't know where it is. <laughs> just sort of look through a few different categories of things before I figure out where they put it. With Maimonides, you think, you look at the, the main categories and you know exactly where he's going to put, you know, whatever you think intuitively would be where it should be is, it's like it's exactly there. The organization was amazing. Um, very clear, very just smart, um, and he was also a great, great, great philosopher. Um, the Moran Yudhuk, the guy who perplexed, is one of the great works of Jewish philosophy. Cell phone! Uh, in, our, in our body of literature at all. Uh, he was very influenced by Aristotle. So people who say that Judaism is this like civilization that never interacts with other ideas and doesn't bring in, you know, outside philosophies, it's crap. Our, our greatest, greatest works of literature are often in discussion with other things happening. Um, so this is from Mishnah Torah, this is from his law code, and it's from Hilchot Deot, Laws of Ethics. And it's not every single piece, but a bunch of, of pieces from mostly chapter 5 and a little bit from chapter 6. And I think it'll be uh, pretty clear as we get going uh, what we're doing here. Yes? He's also a great physician. He was also, yes, he was a great doctor. He was. Um, Maimonides was the, he lived in Egypt most of his life. He was born in Spain. Wasn't really a great time to be living in Spain if you were Jewish. He wound up in Egypt. And he was a doctor and um, worked often for the, the king of Egypt. And so there's this famous letter where he uh, sort of is recounting his day. He gets up super early, he writes some philosophy, he goes off to the doctor to go be a doctor in the king's court and has a full day's work, and then he comes home, and all of the Jews of the extended area are waiting in line for him to come uh, be served. You know, everybody who's got some sort of ailment, like he, he's their doctor too. And so he then serves all of the Jews in the area, and then, you know, he maybe he finally has something to eat at 5 o'clock, you know, in the afternoon, first time in all day, and then he rests for two hours, and then he stays up all night writing uh, his law. I, I mean, it's just sort of studying, or whatever, just, man did not sleep very much. Um, and he's famous for talking about the middle path and self-care, and it's not clear to me how he practiced it in some way. But here we go. Does so somebody want to read? Just start reading uh, number seven, which is, so each of these, like chapter five, you know, halakha, point of Jewish law one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and so this is just number seven in the chapter. Does somebody want to? Right. A learned sage should not shout or scream like an animal or beast when speaking, and should not excessively raise his voice, but should speak to everybody in the pose, and when he does so, he should be careful that it should not sound like haughtiness. One should always be first in any greetings, so that one's mood will always be inclined towards oneself, and one should always judge others to decide the merit. One should always speak up for the benefit of one's <coughs> and never to his detriment. And one should always love and adore peace. Okay, let's stop there. That's already a lot of information. So what what is Maimonides saying? Something wanna give me a couple line summary. Talk softly and not too
Right. So we had speak calmly, be the first to greet people, don't talk against people. Don't think you're better than they are. Don't think you're better than they are, right? What is this? A learned sage should not shout or scream like an animal or beast when speaking. And should not excessively raise his voice. You, you know people like this. Yeah. You know Jews like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, actually just read there's this um, kind of incredible, disturbing um, piece that the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic uh, the magazine has released a bunch of its archives. And there's this piece that somebody wrote in 1939 called I Married a Jew. I just read it this morning because it's on my mind. And it's this woman who's of Ger German origin. It's 1939 and she's writing about why, you know, like her, her marriage with her Jewish husband, but she's awful and condescending, anti-Semitic and nasty about the whole thing. And, you know, it's only when he's around his family does he, you know, revert to his Jewish ways and you know, all this horrible, you know, I'm trying to understand Hitler's point of view. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's the thing, she describes her husband's reactions and certain fights they're having. And on the one hand, you want to be like, poor Ben, and on the other hand, you're like, you married her, you know, <laughs> nothing for you. Um, but there's this moment where they're sitting in Shul. She's talking about her experience of being in Shul at Rosh Hashanah. And she's like, and it's so stunning, you know, the, the weird beanies and the weird shofar, and then and they talk and gossip and laugh all through the service, and it's so, you know, tacky. And they look, and Ben looks at me and he says, what, who can keep quiet for six hours? <laughs> she, you know, then she misses the stately quiet of you know, the Christmas service. Or but look, who can keep quiet for six hours? Um, anyway, it's worth looking up. It's total. Uh, Tangent. Okay, so be careful so you don't sound like haughtiness. Like, what? What are the? What's the underlying logic here? What? What so far is he, is Maimonides' motivation with all of these uh, ways of, of being? Outgoing. Being outgoing. Why? People pay attention to what you're saying. They want to listen. Okay. These are people who want to listen. What else? Pay attention to how you say it. People will pay attention to how you say it. They can teach you in the right place so you know you're grounded in the or outside of it. Great, and it keeps you connected to people, right? Uh, one should be the first to extend in greetings so that one's mood will always be inclined towards oneself. I mean, you know, it's like, it's hard sometimes with these, everybody's writing in the third tense, third person tense, but um, pronoun. Um, and they'll, they'll judge you the side of merit. Why would you want that? What does it matter? What does it matter if you say hi first? You're showing respect to them. Great. You're showing respect to them. And what else? What does it do to their relationship? You're on the same level. It's welcoming. It's welcoming. Right? It increases connection. Right? Even if you are, and he's talking about learned state, right? This is this guy. This is, you know, maybe a little bit of this. Might get looked down on others sort of in the air, right? You're the big scholar in town. Somebody walks up to you. It could be really tempting to just sort of be on, go, go about your business maybe some days, right? Grumpy, you're tired, you don't feel like talking, but what do you need to do? Maybe he's trying to get the learned scholar or the tourist scholar to be more of a mensch versus the uh, connotation Scholars now or Great, so we have this conversation of scholars that are insular, and maybe he's, I mean, this is exactly it. You know, maybe he is trying to bring people out more towards menschiness. I mean, presumably he's not writing in a vacuum, right? So does, does it strike you as possible that there was maybe any of this where he was? A little bit, maybe. I mean, who knows? But he, it occurred to him often, often when it occurs to somebody to write something down, it's because they're seeing something around around them that they're responding to, right? So there might have been a little bit of this. So one of the things that hits me is all of this is about serving everybody else. It's about moderating yourself, restraining yourself, and it's judgment about your behavior. Nice. It's about moderating yourself for the benefit of others. And this is a big thread that we're going to see through a lot of this. And I, I, I think that's an important sort of meta thought to, to keep in mind as we go through this. And then we, as we, I think after we go deeper, we can come back and say, okay, well, what do we think about that? 
right? So we, so we always be first uh, in extending greetings so people will feel good and always judge others to the side of marriage, right? Is there any significance to the fact that <coughs> one should always speak up for the benefit of one's friend and use his friend all through here? And what about others that are not yet your friends? Uh, I mean, I I don't know. Let's see, what's it, what does it say? I think this is a pretty good translation. I don't remember. Uh, I mean, I don't think he's talking about as opposed to my enemies. This is, this guy, you know, but definitely if someone is your friend, then what? Okay, so we have always, so let's start with this for a second, always judging others to the side of marriage. What does that mean, actually? Ten kaf schut is the is an Hebrew uh, phrase. And it's it's the, give it a, a kaf is a, is a palm, so it's the, uh, you know, the scales are weighing, then you give them the favorable weight. What does it what does it mean in real life? Like, what does it look like on the ground? Well, if you do that, then you're not denigrating other people and you're trying to find what's good about them. So this way you'll not be insulting to somebody. Okay, so part of it maybe is about not being insulting. But what else? Yes, it Give the benefit of the doubt. Benefit of the doubt is that that would be the perfect English translation for this, and I deliberately didn't use it because I wanted to see how you guys were gonna get there. So I mean, so what does it mean on the ground? What does it mean to give somebody the benefit of the doubt? You treat them equally. You treat them equally. And what else? You value their opinion. You value their opinion. Err on the side of caution. Err on the side of caution, right? If there's some something going on and you're not sure exactly what the story is or it seems like something, even if it seems like something's a little bit off, what is your first assumption? Not to be judgmental. Don't be, don't be judgmental, right? Assume that they have what kind of intention? <coughs> Good intention. You know, maybe assuming that there's some piece of the story that you don't know, right? <coughs> Might be, the situation might be more complicated than what you're seeing at first blush, right? This is my friend Barry. Why do I assume that he's, you know, acting like a schmuck here when it's possible that the situation is more nuanced than whatever I'm picking up on? Um, how does that, does that play out for us in, in real life naturally? Do you find yourselves, yourselves or people you know? I mean, is that, or even in our culture, is that a place where people run to right away? Oh, I'm sure there's a good, better explanation than whatever I'm seeing. You're shaking your head. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. People see things through their own lens. All of them. Okay, so there's the question of what lens people are seeing. I listened to the WTTW, uh, Bill Ponce, mm -hmm. he had different people come in, and uh, I'm mostly a Democrat, and he'll have Republicans say something, and I'm like, well, as long as I'm listening, I'll, I'll try to open up my mind. And maybe I won't 100%. Agree with them, but at least I can say hmm, I understand a little bit more why he is for that viewpoint. Great. So that's, that's a great example of giving somebody. You know, if there's somebody that's got a political affiliation that you are inclined to, to disagree with, that doing the work of trying to listen and at least better understand where they're coming from is, is huge. Uh, is that something we see a lot in our culture? No. Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. Definitely depend on your relationship to the other person. If you have a closer relationship with someone, you're more inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt than if it's something you don't know. But what sort of the rest of what Maimonides is saying? He said, yes, no. Is that what he's saying? He said, yes, no. He said, yes, no. He said, yes, no. Always, right? It's, um, what is it, Lango? Oh, always judge others. Not just your friends, not just the people that have already proven themselves to you. Always judge, I mean, this is a big statement. Always judge others with the benefit of the doubt. But just like, take a minute and imagine what, you, what your life would be or what our culture would be like if we all moved through the world assuming the best, right? Somebody, you overhear a conversation in a restaurant or 
somebody you care about does something, or somebody that you don't know very well, and you're, you're, you're just inclined to say, well, that, you just want to write them off. They're a terrible person. They're careless. They don't care about their work, you know, whatever it is. Um, this person isn't engaged. This person offended me. Forget them. And to, to, to rather to stop yourself in the process of having that thought and to say, what if there's more story here than whatever I'm seeing? Right? What if what's going on is deeper and more complicated than whatever I'm getting at first blush? What would the, I mean, you know, it, it would absolutely change your interactions with that, wouldn't it? Sometimes that's really hard. <laughs> Sometimes it's really hard to do. And, you know, and they say benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean if there's incontrovertible proof that somebody has done something horrible that you explain it away. But there's this thing about, you know, second guessing your first impulse to assume the worst. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? So I realize that this is a very nice definition of respect, plus it's respect. So uh, I don't see these as rules per se. I see this as a respectful person. So what my mind is saying is a learned scholar should do this, period. And for him, this is a, a piece of law. And there's a big, big question about how we're defining learned scholar. And we can either say everybody in this room is a learned scholar in some way or another in life, and or we could say learned scholar is only this, you know, top, you know, 0.02% of anybody anywhere, and so I'm off the hook, and in which case this is a useful guideline. You could say Jewish law as a philosophy is not something that I consider myself obligated to. It's, you know, it's a philosophical position, and therefore I choose to engage, engage this as wisdom rather than as law. I mean, there, there are a bunch of different ways to slice how you personally interact with this text. So, uh, Maimonides would say, if you, are, if you are a scholar, this is on you, period. Um, you can agree with them or not. <clears throat> I often call my aunties my dead medieval boyfriend, but um, he, and I, he and I disagreed a lot. He had, we, I was not so down with the wife meeting thing. You know, we're not always on the same page. Yes. I'm, a, I'm picturing the ultra orthodox in Israel, uh -huh. and this would be the, the antithesis of what they, they do. So that's, there's a, you know there are as as in many places there's a, there's a lot of question about this is this is our great wisdom and how do we live it out in the world. And it could be that you know someone might say, well, a learned scholar is really only you know these five rabbis that I can name, or somebody might say, I do that just for you know people in my community. And here's another text that says if you're not you know Sabbath observant, I don't need to pay attention to you. But you know all of that stuff is in our tradition. So uh, these are our ideals, and we here in this room have a lot of choice about how we can interact. Should we keep going? Okay, so judge others to the side of merit. That's a big one. Always speak up for the benefit of one's friend and never to his detriment. And one should always love and adore peace. What do you get from that? What does that mean? Very positive outlook. Definitely positive outlook.
you know, if somebody says, you know, whatever, what's going on with this person, you know, should we include them, should whatever, what's the answer? You try to engage them positively. And this, this, by the way, Jewish law is very clear that if someone is going to get involved in, mostly in a business decision, but it's also been extended, I think, to talk about, you know, other situations in a way that's going to harm them, you're allowed to warn them. So, for example, if somebody says, gee, I think I'm going to invest my life savings with Bernie Madoff, <laughs> you're allowed to say, I don't think that's a very good idea, right? Um, and if somebody says, gee, I want to send my kid to this school, I think it's a, you know, the principal seems great, I think he really loves children, you're allowed to indicate that you might know that that person, uh, you know, if the person is a sexual abuser and you know that, you have an obligation not only to warn somebody not to send their kid to that school, but also to engage with the authorities, right? It's not tail-bearing to make sure that justice is served and to keep people from harm. But that's not this, right? What's the, there's the nuance. So let's assume your friend is not setting up a Ponzi scheme, right? <clears throat> then there's, you know, there's, there are all sorts of shades of gray with this. Yes? Thoughts? Reflections? Well, I'm not sure the shades of gray is. It says one should always love to be there because all the loving is the one's right for the other person. So it's, a, it's almost chapter you know, to the to figure out what can we do to be loving and kind of all the other person. Right? And I think the glory of peace is not seeking to strive to a peaceful way of respect. Great, so there's a sense of checking your ego at the door. Do what you can to try to help those that you know and those around you in whatever way you can to boost their signals and you know, try to get them supported and connected and you know, and to help them in whatever way you can and you know, to not be the person who's fanning the flames of drama. Right? There are enough little places where somebody says <clears throat> You know, I don't know. There are a lot of there are a lot of places where, where a third party can be have a strong effect on what's going on in a potential disagreement, and there are a lot of places where you can be the second party who has a lot of you know a lot of uh, power to decide whether a piece is going to be pursued or not. Right? If something happens, if there's a slight, how do you respond? You know, do you want to be that that guy basically who's creating strife, or do you want to be the person who's uh, it, down. it seems in America we've taken this a step farther. If you have an argument with somebody, instead of trying to solve it, you get a gun and you go and you shoot people. And so that's this is a consequence of really going totally away from it. You know, like we're all paying for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, you know, Judaism is really clear about this. Right? and um, the fact that life is the primary value above all else and the things that risk and endanger people's lives need to be um, handled. But yeah, we're, you know, we, we, we have a little bit in our culture lost the love, peace, and pursuit peace culture, right? I'm on Twitter and Facebook, and the number of times somebody says something and someone, instead of assuming the best, you know, jumps on them and this, you know, creates the strife, it creates the drama, and how could you say that, and what's wrong with you, and na 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 rather than trying to get to a place of understanding. And I see sometimes there's those people will, on Twitter will kind of pile on. Somebody says something, and they probably, didn't, they probably didn't mean it came out funny, or they didn't realize how it sounded, or, you know, who knows, and you can give them the benefit of the doubt and say, can you care to elaborate in another comment? Or, you know, sort of like shame factory will sort of, you know, how dare you, you're so bad, you're so wrong, you're so mean, you're so evil, and it's intense. And it's, you know, sort of the opposite of this ethos. I see that a lot in politics, right? Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, if your dog dies, it's Obama's fault. You know, <laughs> there are people that no matter what happens, they will turn it around to be somebody else's fault and usually the leader of the country. But this happens all the time in politics where, uh, you know, you find some way to blame somebody else and make it somebody else's fault and somebody said something off the cuff that wasn't prepared and we jump on them and, you know, it's not a very generous uh, cultural moment in some ways, you know? 
And we have a lot of power to be people who change that in our own lives. You know? um, okay. If one sees what one wants to say will be useful to listen to, one should say it. And if not, then one shouldn't. What does this mean? One should not reconcile one's friend when one is angry, nor ask him about his vow when he makes it, until one's temperament has cooled and settled. Furthermore, one should not comfort one's bereaved friend while the deceased is front of him, for he is hard pressed until the burial. Okay? Thoughts, comments? Let's 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 take this apart. What 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 is he saying and what does it look like now? Okay. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong on this. Yeah, I may need help on this. I kind of recall correctly that until the burial, the deceased the deceased is the primary uh, yes. the yes. primary yes. focus. Yes. And then after the burial, the 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 one becomes the focus. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, from the time that someone dies until they're buried, the, our main agenda is keep taking care of um, the person who's died and making sure that they are not left alone. We have a tradition that, that after one, someone dies, that somebody's with them until they're buried, uh, and you know whatever else needs to happen, that that's where the energy is. And then, and you're right. And then after the funeral, then we focus our attention on the mourner and the state between someone dying. And the burial is called Aninut, and for the mourner, certain certain kinds of restrictions apply. And then Avelut uh, is this the, is the time of more formal time of mourning is between the burial and the end of whatever the mourning period is, depending on which relative has died, uh, and different kinds of restrictions. Some similar and some different kinds of restrictions apply <coughs> during that, but it's stricter during Aninut during this early time. But mainly, I mean, what's what's this idea? You shouldn't try to comfort somebody while they're dead. I mean, what, what's he saying here? What's the point? There's no point because they're not going to be in a position to to accept it. Great. This is exactly right. You should because if somebody's not going to be able to listen, oh, it's going to be okay. Like, this is my cat. No, it's not okay. Do you see that this is not okay? You know, later on, you can try to give words of love and comfort and try to talk to them about what happens next. But... You know, if somebody's just died in my arms, this is a, you know, my, my words of comfort are just, I mean, they're, they're trite. They're meaningless, right? They should be allowed. Give them some space to have the, the, the and even in, in their morning period, you never ask a mourner how they're doing. That's one of the questions. How, how are you is not a question because, as the Talmud says, duh. You know, <laughs> we know how you're doing. Not well. I mean, there are, there are ways you can sort of, compassionately, lovingly, today, ask them how they're doing without asking them how they're doing, you know what I mean? You can check in with people, but, um, yeah, but right now, like, shut up, everything's gonna be okay, right? Now, right now, well, uh, you know, I'm with this person, like, of course it's not okay, and that's okay, and when there's space for that, um, sort of grief and horror and awe and, and you know, Denial and anger and bargaining and depression and all of that stuff, you know, there's space for that this chasm that opens up. Like, there's space for that in the tradition. We're not going to just try to pretend everything's funny. Because sometimes it's not. What about a hug? I mean, I just didn't, the idea of being totally alone. We're not saying don't connect with the person. Okay. But the idea of trying to comfort the mourner, like something I'm going to say is going to have some you know, impact on them. Like, you know, I mean, you know, I think often, if you want to sort of, if you want to sort of take a pastoral moment here, uh, often my experience is that when people are in mourning or in crisis or whatever, sometimes the most effective thing we can do is to just show up and be present. You know, to bring our loving, compassionate, you know, stand there, you put your hand on their back while they're in whatever space they are, so they're able to have whatever experience they need, there's a sense that you're there, or a hug, or just sitting next to them, or checking in, do you want me in the room or not, or you know what I mean? Some of it, it should be like not, not consensual premise, uh, presence, right? Uh, but sometimes the thing that you show up do is just show up and radiate love at them, and you know, at a certain point, it'll be time for words, but it doesn't always have to be every moment. You know, and that's also, this is a great 
way to engage people it should up to. Like, sometimes it's time for words, and sometimes there is, you don't need words, and that's okay too. Um, so, but what's, okay, so let's get back to this overall idea, right? Um, if one sees that wants, what wants to, wants, wants to say will be useful and listened to, one should say it, and if not, then don't. Okay, there's the big event. What does this mean? Don't try to reconcile. So let's see what the, the, the examples. Don't try to reconcile one friend, a friend when they're angry. What does that mean? I'm they're not going to listen to you anyway. So you have to right. wait until they cool down, and then if they get whipped, you have the opportunity. Yeah, it's not they're not going to listen. It's that they can't listen. And they're so correct. So they just can't hear it. So you're wasting. And You're this setting it more Totally. Totally. And this, by the way, um, is going to sort of classic couples counseling kind of advice, too, right? If you're in the blue zone, everybody's calm, you can have a conversation. If it starts to mean it's one or both of you is in the red zone, you know, this sort of angry, agitated, not able to hear, triggered, whatever the word is, you know, if, you, if, if somebody's in the space where they're not going to be able to listen, you just take a break. And you come back when everybody's able to have a conversation, right? I mean, this is like marriage 101, uh, which, you know, I had to learn <laughs> a little bit into my marriage. <laughs> uh, we got it. Um, but this idea that, that you know, you, you can't, sometimes you just can't, can't talk about hard things if somebody's not in the space of the year. So you let them cool down and then you go talk about it. This is pretty straightforward, right? It's logical. Okay, so. Furthermore, to cover the bereaved, right? And the, so, so, what do you guys think about this? If one sees that what wants to, one wants to say will be useful and listened to, one should say it, and if not, one shouldn't. Wise words, how does this work for us over here in the real world? Thoughts, comments? I think those are very wise words, but I don't think it's always easy for us to do that. It's, it is hard <laughs> in the real world. Sometimes, you know, zip it. Sometimes, uh, just before the funeral, when you go through the line, mm -hmm. I'll get to the person who I know, you know simply say, let my hand go towards you. Totally. Some, sometimes, there's nothing that's going to make you feel you're going to say that's going to be helpful. Um, uh, how many people, uh, uh, people in our room are parents? A lot of you. How many times have you had something to say that you know is not useful and will not be listened to, and you say it anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it happens. Like, I feel like that's a, that's a dynamic where it's almost hardest to resist, or the spousal one, where it's you know, come on. But sometimes, when you're a parent, you know, and you see that the other person is not falling into the hole of disaster. I say, I'm the mother, I have that right, that's my innate right. You may not want to hear it, but I think that's going to be a disaster. You could do what you want, that's my place. So, the, yeah, yeah, there's a question about, you know, how this works in the parenting dynamic and, and when and are there exceptions and all of that. But, uh, you know, I think probably a lot of us have had that experience of knowing that what we're going to say is going to get heard, and we got to say it anyway, right? Who, who is that about, really? Who does that serve? Well, it's about me. It's, it serves us, right? What does Maimonides say? Vote for the other person. It's not about you! Guess what? It's not about you. I know you want it to be about you. This is what you're saying about this sort of like there's a tzimtzum is the Hebrew word, this sort of contraction of the ego. Um, this is the part where you pull back your need to be taking up all this space. Who aren't going to say something that's not going to get heard. They're going to wait until the moment 
they're either going to be able to prime circumstances so that they will be heard, or they will be able to adjust the, what they're going to say to be something that's heard, or they'll wait till the moment when they know the, the student is ready, and then they'll, they'll go there. <coughs> right? And that's what they, that is the difference between those one or two teachers you think about when you think about the great teachers in your life who, who have influenced you, and everybody else's name you can't really remember. Right? That's the difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want to just say it again, like this isn't a, you know, it's not about you being the special sparkly one, <coughs> right? It's lovely that you have this witty thing to say, but if nobody's going to hear it, just shut up, you know? It's just, it's not the time, it's not now, right? One should not change what one says, or add and detract from one's words, except in words of peace or similar things. The general rule is not to speak except in connection with wisdom, charitable acts, and Things. My mother always used to say, can't say something nice, don't say anything you want. And again, how, how easy or hard is that to live in the real life, in the real world? Hard. 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 It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard to always tr encourage you know, good things about the people we know. It's hard to, to uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. And it's hard to get up. So what about food you're not, you're not receptive now, but maybe you'll go home and you'll, 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 you'll bring it in your head. Somebody want to share with me an experience of someone giving food for thought that they weren't receptive to and how that went? I may be receptive, but that's happening all the time. Okay, it happens it's all the time. It's not just food for thought. I usually argue against it. Are you against what? Whatever's being said to me. It happens to me a lot of the Okay, so it may be that later on there's some sense that there's something to it, but you know, often there's a sense of like, why are you telling me this? You know, this sort of sense of almost wanting to rebel against your next move of thought. She said, Mayock, if, if I'm going to get made up with a stick, I should have to tell people. Well, they're, they're not interested because they're only making money. They think I'm crazy, but at least I could. But that's, that's a different story. That's somebody's going to do something that's going to harm them. We're talking about there are many, many, many other more nuanced situations in life. And I'd love to focus more on that because black and white, somebody's about to lose their you know, savings in a Ponzi scheme. That's a totally different situation. <coughs> I have a 22-year-old son. Okay. And I told him he should get a flu shot. And he said, well, I'm not going to get the flu. And I said, well, you know, you don't know if you're going to get the flu. And he said, well, you know, maybe I'll get a flu shot. And finally, I called him every day. Did you know, <laughs> get a flu shot yet? And then finally, after about a week, he called and said, I'm really tired of you calling me. I got a flu shot. <laughs> yeah. So we have a story. We have a story of effective, uh, if assaultive parenting. <laughs> but no, it's just like, tell me, that, like, there, have you ever had somebody say, in a nutshell, I know you're not going to listen, I know this isn't what you want to hear, but I'm going to tell you anyway? Is it well received? No. No. It's fun, fun for me personally to be the person to share my important nugget of wisdom, but when people are sure that they have something important to say to me, and it's not, it wasn't asked for, it wasn't, you know, it's not going to be well received, it's not the time, it's not appropriate, it's not the context, you know, my response is a little bit like, you know, get off me. What does it do for the relationship? I think, I think it depends. So, you know, I think you need to understand, it depends on the relationship you have with that individual. Of course, it always, so, it always depends on the relationship. So there are people that have told me things in my life that I've not wanted to hear, but I've described it before, but I've resisted it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it has the possibility to damage the relationship. Not always. And you know, as you guys are all saying, I think this is really true. A lot of this is contextual and there are a lot of nuances. And I think we're not necessarily talking about mom haranguing son to go get the flu shot, right? Um, that was very effective. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, it has a, that, that person that walks into the room that wants to make everything all about themselves, right? Look, I'm so helpful and comforting my friend who's mourning. Look at me. I'm so comforting. I have these great words of wisdom. And your friend is like, not now. Not now. Right? Then it damages the relationship and it makes you look kind of like an idiot. <laughs> I think, you know, Maimonides, so what, what is Maimonides trying to tell us here about who you should be in the world and how you should be that person? Humble, respectful of others. Sometimes it is for me the world is created, but a lot of times I am the dust and ashes. And particularly, I think, if you're the Torah scholar moving through the world, right, people are going to uh, almost immediately defer to you. And I think we can extend this concept of Torah scholar in a lot of ways. We are all, I think everybody in this room, people of tremendous privilege, right? We're all white. We all have access to, you know, Chicago's North Shore. Like, there's, there's a lot that we have going for us as we move through the world. And in ways that we're conscious of or not, people may defer to us. Um, you know, and those ways that it's a really, really powerful story that went around recently about why do poor people spend money on expensive things. And this is a really beautiful essay on, I don't remember where. She basically said, if I want to be taken seriously in a job interview or, you know, as I move through the world or as I'm helping someone navigate, you know, scary government bureaucracy, if I want to be taken seriously not as one of those people, but as somebody who is of your status, Right, of your stature. I need to work really, really hard to dress as one of you and to be like one of you and to not wear my cotton tank top to wear a silk shell under my suit. And, you know, because there are little things that will cause people with tremendous privilege, consciously or not, to discount me and not take me seriously. Does that make sense? I would gander that probably all of us in this room don't have to work very hard to be taken seriously if we're walking up to a government agency and has some forms to be, you know, we get seen as the people that could raise hell with the manager if we need, you know? And so we are already, in some ways, this person. And so it behooves us to think about how other people consciously or unconsciously interact with us and what kind of person we want to be when they do. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, should we keep going? Okay, let's talk about clothes, speaking of clothes. Somebody want to start reading number nine? For clothing of a learned sage should be pleasant and clean, and it is forbidden for him to be able to find the stain or pettiness. He should not wear the clothing of royalty, such as gold or gold, <coughs> and similar things, for the reason that everyone looks at them. And nor should he dress like a poor person, for the reason that this disgraces his dress, but he should wear clothes of an average fineness. One's flesh should not be visible through or seen from under one's clothing. <laughs> As is possible with the clothes of very thin linen made in Egypt, and nor should one's clothes trail on the ground like the clothes of those with white ears, and one's clothes should reach one's ankles, and one's sleeve should reach one's knuckles. One should not let down one's cloak for the reason that this would appear white, but one may do so on the Sabbath if one does not get a chance, a change of clothes. One should not put on patch shoes which have patches on top of patches in the summer, but in the winter one may if one is a poor person. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So what, somebody want to give me the, in a nutshell, summary of, of all of this? This is fashion advice from my mind. <laughs> If, if you're going to communicate with a person, if you're not dressed appropriately, the person will concentrate at either you're too haughty or too poor, I mean, as far as I go for purple or what, you know, and not pay attention to what you're saying. So the clothes should get into the way of the more important future communication. Great. There's a possibility that somebody might be focusing more on your very, very fancy clothes or your very, very poor present presentation rather than on the interaction. Yeah. Um, I think you should just, what he's saying is be modest in your dress and clean and neat and um, not too flashy, not too um, poor and you know, I wish teenagers would <laughs> <laughs> Right. 
So not too flashy, not too poor, not wearing any of those uh, those linen clothes like they have in Egypt. Right? <laughs> um, I mean, so so we we I think there are a few reasons why. One is that we want the person to focus on what you're saying. What else? Wasn't there a part in the uh, Torah where the dress of the Levites were also, you know, and the Konan, Konan were also, you know, prescribed as well? Yes. So that maybe to make that distinction, or it's a, it's a good line of thinking, my mind is that that was the, the clothing for the Kohanim, the priests, and the Levites who were sort of assistants to the priests, really. Um, in the during the temple era, there was a lot of discussion about that in the Torah, and these, you know, these really groovy clothes with this, you know, garment that has bells all over the bottom, and you know, the high priest got to wear this unbelievable piece of bling that is uh, it was this um, very, very holy, very sacred breastplate with all these gemstones and stuff that were used for potentially for divination. We're not sure. <coughs> um, that was during the temple times and in the temple. So the, there's definitely a conversation about what the people officiating at our holiest space should wear in our holiest space. Absolutely. But now we're, you know, now it's the, the temple was destroyed in 70 CE. Now it's a thousand years later. We're living in Egypt. You know, there are Jews, there are Muslims, there are all sorts of people around. Um, you know, how you, what happens when you're walking down the street is really the question. Other thoughts about the un underlying logic? The, yeah. first, the first dress for success book. <laughs> <laughs> the very first dress for success book, yes. Well, isn't this another piece of that being humble and showing respect? You okay. don't want to like show off. Mm -hmm. You also don't you want to show respect to people. If they're poorer, you don't want them to feel terrible. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just, clothes aren't important. You have to look good, you have to look clean, but you should not go crazy overboard, or you shouldn't mm -hmm. not. Great. So you shouldn't. You both shouldn't go totally. You, you know, it's about respect. It's not about showing off what you have, but it's also not about kind of doing the reverse show off. You know the. You know. Oh yeah. You know sort of. <laughs> you know, college student, high school, college. You know, early twenties is a, the type of like. Oh yeah, I'm so poor. You know, sort of like romanticizing. Yeah. Uh, poverty in a way that, you know, for people who actually don't have any food to eat, poverty is not romantic at all, right? You need to look like a respectable person. You need to move through the world. You need to take yourself seriously. You need to look like you take other people seriously without looking like it's, you know, hello, me and my designer clothes. <laughs> Is the message here. 
also not this faux, like, look at me, you know, and so, and so forth, unless you have, and even if you don't have means, and some of the people he's talking about clearly don't, even so, you should try to show up looking like a scholar, right? Looking like you're not a person in need, so that people don't immediately start worrying about you, but like you're your peer. So that you can show up and say, what do we have to say to each other? Right? And then all of the bells and whistles in either direction can be a distraction from this thing that's supposed to happen. Yes? Okay. Should we keep going? How many, so far, how many of these have we hit so far? Human, honest, don't take advantage, caring, shows up, kind, sympathetic, helps others, rises to the occasion, generous, honorable, does the right thing. I mean, so far, not entirely this conversation, but are, we, are you starting to see some patterns here? Good. Walk and talk. Let's keep going. Um, actually, let's do 13. Let's get number 11. We can get back to it. Sometimes do and sometimes don't. But as Marilyn touched on, 
you don't have to be the center of attention, but there are times and places that doesn't mean you don't get to exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. He specifically says um, of a learned sake, mm -hmm. so I think we also have to be sure that we know what we're talking about before acting like a sage. For sure. I think there's I think it's an important distinction that, that there's a sense of you have to know what you're talking about. And I heard somebody mention this once somewhere on the internet, but I haven't really read it up, up on it myself, but I'm gonna run around having this opinion even though I kind of really don't know, is not what we're talking about. We're talking about belief and truth. Right? Things you know to be true. And who's true? Who's true? Who's true? Who's true? Ah, $64,000 question. Uh, I would over here in the 21st century with my like wild interpretation uh, of it say, at, to, at least at minimum, my own personal truth. But I think there's also a sense of Torah truth. Yeah. So, so this is something I thought about a lot. I think there's a subjective truth. Does that make sense? 
thoughts, comments, questions? Um, okay, here's a couple minutes. Um, so if you, if you should say no, you should say yes. Um, be particular about yourself regarding accounts, right? Abolish other people's debts to him and not be particular about them. What is, what's the, uh, you think one or two words that goes with that? I think it's kind of a victory if you're supposed to be watching your own accounts mm -hmm. and you forgive somebody who owes you money. It's not really watching your own account. It's a money question. It's different than that. I think okay. it's being generous. Generous. So in other words, I'm going to take care of the stuff in my house being stuff I owe other people. They don't mean it's not as big a deal as it. I'd rather pay them than collect from them. I think that's exactly what he's saying. That I need to be careful that I'm not, I don't have a bunch of debts open and running. I have to be particular about paying other people back. And if other people owe me money, you know, as my grandfather used to say sometimes, like, it's all one pocket, you know. And, to, you know, again, we have this, this tension about letting it not, you know, letting other people's needs other people's, what, what's important to other people to be a little bit more at the forefront than you sometimes. Does that make sense? And obviously, I mean, I think it's implied that this is if you're in a position to be able to, to have that be the case, right? Um, well, yeah. then it should be a gift, not a loan. Oh, so it's like if somebody, if, if somebody owes you money and they say, I'm going to pay you back on Thursday, and they come on Thursday with your money, awesome. Thank you. That, that was good. Everybody's happy. Um, and if they are supposed to come on Thursday, and they don't, and then so you talk about next Thursday, and they don't come, and they come up the week after, and they don't come at a certain point, you know, like maybe that one's a gift, and maybe this one's a loan, you know, and maybe you don't always know which it's going to be, and maybe that's, you know, the person that isn't going to come that Thursday, he still knows he owes you money, and two years from now, maybe he'll show up, <coughs> you know, I don't think they're saying you have to give all your money away every all the time to everyone, but there's this sense of sort of generosity when you when you have it available to give. Does that make sense? Well, maybe it's generosity in spirit. A man doesn't have the money. You have to be understanding it. A man comes to you say, I I know I owe you money and I just don't have it. I know I said I'm coming on Thursday. Maybe you have to be generous of spirit and say, Well, try to have it next week. That type of thing. Totally. You're not Totally. And sometimes you abolish other people's debts. Sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's that time. But it's not, it's not, they're not saying, you know, only give people money and tell them they can, you know, here's a big chunk of change and come back next week for more. You know, it's not much that you're an ETM, but there's a sense of uh, softness about how your money lending goes. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So I, I wanna, let's just look at the, Last line of number 13. The general rule. So I'm going to read this. The general rule is that one should be amongst the pursued and not amongst the pursuers and amongst the humiliated and not amongst the humiliators. Be amongst the pursued and not amongst the pursuers, the humiliated and, amongst the, uh, and not the humiliators, right? That. So we want to sum up that piece and everything we've talked about this morning. What's, what's he saying? Well, he's not. He, hopefully, he's not saying lend somebody some money. They don't pay you back, and then lend them some more. I hopefully he's not saying that. He's, he's not. He's not saying that. But he's saying if somebody somebody is really, really, genuinely not able to pay back their debts, uh, give them a little breathing space. You know. It's okay this one time with that one person to, to lay off the debt collection. But not, you know, not to be a fool. No, it's not, not to be a fool. There's a, there's a difference between being generous and being a fool. And what that line is and what it looks like may be different for other people, for different people. But. I really don't like the line of be, be humiliated because if you've been giving money to somebody and they don't pay you back. Are you humiliated or are you a bitch? So, there, so I don't a, like that di dichotomy that he set up. <clears throat> the, the, there's a bunch of stuff, but we're, we're just about out of time, so I didn't want to, I wanted to sort of get straight there. So I don't want us to focus on the connection between the humiliating and the, and the debt absolving. But does somebody want to speak to this? Be humiliated and not the humiliator. Oh, I think maybe 
not be a bully, not be part of the group that's picking on somebody else, but stand with that somebody else? Don't yes, don't be a bully. Be an ally to the the victims. Absolutely. What else?